uh, how this work you're doing will improve policy and increase justice, liberty, security, and prosperity. I'm convinced that that is the case. The work that you are doing is extremely important and very, very valuable. I'd really like to thank Danu and Anthony and their team and all the people who have worked to bring this together uh, because it takes a lot of logistical work. Uh, every time we see an invisible hand, sometimes there is a visible hand someplace behind it making it happen. And their hands have been very active. And to thank them also for their hospitality and for their traditional South Indian graciousness. It's very, very much appreciated. <clears throat> uh, it's common in the work that we do uh, to focus on opinions or theories, not as much on facts. And I think that's a mistake. And when I began this discussion with Donna, because I was impressed with the work CPPR has done, to generate new information to drive the policy process. I had a discussion with John Blundell, who was the president of the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. The IEA is one of the grandmother institutes, if you will. The IEA was set up in the 1950s uh, by Sir Anthony Fisher. He hired, as he said, the last two liberal economists still alive in England, Ralph Harris, Arthur Selden, to begin a process of transforming Britain. They did it not just by opinions. They went out and found the facts on the ground. And the studies that they produced over the years had an enormous cumulative effect. England, because of the experience of the war and having to mobilize society to defeat a terrible, terrible enemy, National Socialism, Fascism, generated a highly collectivized system that then was taken over by the Labour Party, and you saw nationalization, nationalization, nationalization. And the effect was simply terrible. England was turning into what they call a third world country, rapidly declining. And IEA generated studies that changed the minds of the public in Britain. The effects of price controls and rationing and nationalization were so clearly manifestly terrible, but they documented it and brought it to public attention. And they changed Britain. I've been involved in a number of policy debates in the United States. I flew here essentially from Guatemala. I was 10 days ago in Lebanon. We had a project with their partners there at the Lebanon Audit in Arabic, French, and English to look at economic policy there. So then I flew from Lebanon to Guatemala for a program there, and then from Guatemala for a few hours to Washington for a radio debate, and then from Washington to here. This may account for my <clears throat> lung infection. But in the debate on uh, gun policy in the United States, which I'm very much involved in, there's an enormous amount of misinformation. Our president was on television saying the following claims, <clears throat> and they deserve to be refuted, which I did on the radio. He said, because of our background checks, we have kept 1.5 million guns out of the wrong hands. Or rather, he said, guns out of the hands of 1.5 million of the wrong people. That is to say, if you want to buy a handgun or any kind of weapon, they do a background check if you're a criminal or not, and you can be denied. But the president didn't mention that 96% of those denials were withdrawn within hours because they're what we call false positives. Almost all the rest of them were withdrawn after an investigation. So the correct number in 2010 was they kept guns out of the hands of 13 people which is less impressive than 1.5 billion, at least to me. Now that's the number of people who actually were disqualified at the end. Breaking up that this was a false positive is important information, and it's pretty easy to check. I'll give you a simple example. 
the United States government now has something which I also find profoundly objectionable and unreasonable called the no-fly list. If your name is on the list, the government says you can't get on an airplane. Which I happen to think is an outrageous denial of due process of law. We had a senator named Senator Edward Kennedy, a very famous member of the United States Senate. It turns out there's an Irish terrorist with the same name, Edward Kennedy. So five times this member of the United States Senate was denied the right to board an airplane. They knew he was a U.S. Senator, but his name was on the list. It was a false positive. Imagine that the president had gone on television and said, five times we kept terrorists off of airplanes. But this is what was just claimed in the president's big presidential address. Uh, <clears throat> a whole series of false facts, if you will, that drive bad policy. <clears throat> I think we can do much better we can generate not only refutation of bad information, as I was trying to do, but useful, correct, verifiable information to drive public policy. In a presentation of the sort that was made here, or others, normally there are three things that you can accomplish. You can inform people of a fact that is important. You can persuade them to be of your opinion. And you can motivate them to do something. It's rare that you can do all of those things in one presentation. Although it's possible, it's extremely difficult and rare. Uh, because so many of us have strong opinions about matters, we focus on the second and the third, persuading people motivating them. But if you don't have the facts right, if you are not yourself properly informed, your arguments may be mistaken, they will not be persuasive, and they will not motivate you. So it's very important that we begin by informing ourselves. New information, especially, can be very powerful because if you release into the public discussion information not previously known, you can dominate the discussion. You can set the agenda. Some of our colleagues in other parts of the world, I think Peru is a good example, uh, when Hernando de Soto and his colleagues, Enrique and Maria Gersi, produced their book, The Other Path, it changed the discussion, not only in Latin America, but in much of the world. They documented with new research how difficult it was to start a business in Peru. Why is it a surprise that so much of the economy is underground and the government is subject to so much corruption? That research changed the world because it began a discussion about the informal economy, which exists all around the world, but the benefits of helping that to become the formal economy through recognition of rights, through property rights, through reducing the onerous burdens of starting a business. One of the most memorable examples, that I think was statistically sound, was good public policy research, and it did change Peru and much of the rest of the world. They took two university educated lawyers and they said, start a business with two sewing machines for a tailor for making garments. Document how many hours and days and months it takes for you to fill out the paperwork. And these are university trained lawyers, not people with poor literacy skills, but the high end of literacy. <coughs> and only pay bribes when you absolutely have to, but make sure you count them. Nine months later, with some bribes, these two lawyers were able to open their shop. Then they flew to Miami and did the same thing in three hours with no bribes. And what they said was that's one of the differences between Lima and Miami, why we are poor here in Lima. And 
they began a process to make it easier for people to have access to the market, to reduce the numbers of permits and paperwork, and so on. And they drove an agenda of discussion in a very positive way. Now, of course, the information that you derive has to be combined with sound analysis so we can make sense of what it is that we're discussing. It's not just some numbers tossed out into the ether or tossed out under the broadcast waves. There's analysis combined with it that will help us to understand the world. We can talk about, and I mentioned one of my favorite issues, protectionism. I think is one of the economic policies we could describe as not only mistaken, but authentically and honestly stupid. Protectionism making it more difficult for you to trade with other people or buy things at lower prices is <coughs> uh, the policy of the stupid party. We can document the dead weight losses. You know. Sorry, I know duck on my desk, I should have turned that off. I wasn't taking it with ring here at whatever ungodly hour it is, where it was coming from. Um, uh, we can look at how it causes corruption, one of the bribes that are paid uh, to border officials and so on. Uh, the dead weight losses, that is to say, not merely there was a transfer from A to B, but in the process, wealth was dissipated. $100 was lost by A, and $40 was received by B in value. $60 of value was lost in some sense. But we need to show how that happens. What is the mechanism by which these things take place? And to do that, we do need the proper concepts, opportunity costs, what Basquiat called the seen and the unseen, one of the most important notions economic, political analysis, the trade-offs, the idea of action happening on the margin, and so on, with which I think we are quite familiar. But that said, we need the facts, we need the evidence, we need the data to be able to persuade other people that our opinions are consistent with the facts, with sound and logically consistent analysis, and that they represent positive changes to the world, the policies based on that are implemented. Having done that, of course, now you have to engage in the next stage, which is to think strategically about how to motivate people, to think strategically about persuading them, but also about motivating them. Voters, politicians, bureaucrats, Business people, trade union members, and trade union leaders, those are two different groups with rather different interests frequently. Uh, <clears throat> religious leaders, and others who are active in the policy process. Work with them and ask in what way they will benefit from these changes, in what way they could be enlisted on your side, or if they're likely to be opposed to you, that their opposition can be neutralized various ways. That involves a lot of strategic interaction. Those are some of the things that we do in public policy research and analysis. But now I want to ask, why? Why do we do this? What's it all for? How, why is it worth all the trouble? What's in it for us? What's our motivation for doing that? While the process may be enjoyably challenging, lots of people like a big challenge, I have to tell you, defeating rent-seeking and generating free societies is a pretty big challenge, so that might be enjoyable. It might be an occasion for us to shine in the light of publicity. And we can be honest, for most of us, that's pretty attractive too. And that's a little benefit that we get. If you're on radio or television or you have an article in the newspaper or you're quoted someplace, uh, that's a benefit. And we shouldn't be afraid to admit it. But we can make friends. I think that's taken place here at this program. That's valuable. We can expand our networks. And we can even travel to fabulous 
beautiful, wonder places, wonderful places like Kerala and New Delhi, which represent something that many people just dream about doing, to be able to go to such beautiful and wonderful places. Okay, those are motivations. I think for all of us here, they play various roles in why we do this. But you could get a lot of that other ways also. Other ways to make friends, other ways to arrange to travel and see the world. And as a general rule, this is not a good way to become rich. If you want to become rich, there are other things you probably should be focusing your attention on. You can do okay if you work hard, perfect it, you can have a good life with all these other benefits of a network of friends around the world. But you're not going to become uh, Mr. Tata or Mr. Bill Gates, anything like that. So if that's your concern, this is the time to head for the exits. Uh, we do it for other reasons. We do it for justice. We do it for liberty. We do it for security. We do it for prosperity. In short, we do it because we care about what is right and good. Those things matter to us. They matter to everyone to some extent. Anyone who had no concern for that is a psychopath. And there are such people, just not very many. But for us, these motivations are dominant. And I'd like to talk a little bit about those motivations. Justice, liberty, security, and property. And that means a little bit of philosophy, but not that heavy, no metaphysics. It won't hurt to talk about it. Let's start with justice. Uh, very few people would stand up and say, you know, justice, I'm against it. There's a concept of justice that most people have raised their for, but there are many different conceptions of justice, when I put it that way. We argue about it because you and I, or you and someone else, they have different conceptions of justice. You have a common concept. The liberal conception of justice, though, is rather special in that it's integrated with other ideas in ways that others are not. Because we flesh out the liberal concept or conception of justice with rights. Rights are a very important element in the liberal conception of justice. If you go back into the history of this discussion, uh, certainly in European philosophy, I think also in others, you see elements of the Mahabharata, other great Indian epics, and in the works of such figures as Lao Tzu, China, Mencius. The idea of objective right, the right ordering of the world, how things ought to be, is sometimes called justice right. Many European languages have the same word, English and German, right. And I say, this is my right. Right thing to do and my right. And German, French, and other languages as well. Objective right is the right order of the world. It's a right, just society. But then subjective right is about my rights and your rights. How are those two connected? Liberalism connects them. Other philosophies tear them apart. Because under liberal conception, if the rights of persons are well defined and legally secure, and for alienable rights can be transferred one to another, like <coughs> automobiles and land and so on, you get a just society. Thomas Aquinas understood this very well. Robert Nozick, great libertarian philosopher at Harvard University, talked about a justice-preserving transformation. If you get the rights correct, and the way that people can transform their rights is just. The outcome, which is unpredictable, is just. So we can't predict exactly what a just society will look like. Who will own what? Who will live where? Who will be married to whom? That's dependent on all the choices of the members of society based on their exercising their own rights and respecting the rights of other people. 
Now, if we think about that liberal approach, which reconciles or makes coordinate the rights of individuals and the justice of the social order that comes out from it, we see how important is the rule of law to the protection of liberty. Liberty isn't doing just anything that comes into your mind. Whatever you want to do right now. Some people have defined liberty that way, Rousseau and others. To be free is to be totally unconstrained. I'll do anything I want. But that isn't the liberal conception of freedom. The liberal conception of a free society. Rather, <clears throat> a free society in which people enjoy liberty is defined by the rule of law. It's an essential element. John Locke put it very neatly, the end of law, I quote from the Second Treatise, is not to abolish or to restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. Where there is no law, there is no freedom. He was exactly right about this. Some people have thought if we just got rid of laws, well, then we'd all have freedom. But in fact, the opposite. No one would have freedom under a condition in which there was no law whatsoever. He continued the liberty. Freedom is a liberty to dispose and order as you desire. Your person, actions, possessions, <clears throat> and your whole property within the allowance of those laws under which you are, and therein not to be subject to the arbitrary will of another. That a condition of not being free is when you are subject to the arbitrary will and power of another person. We see that all around the world. Dictators, authoritarian strongmen, criminals who subject the rest of us to their Arbitrary will. A great man whom I had the great privilege to meet, Chen Guangcheng from China, has made it very clear if you know the story of this man. He's a lawyer, he alerted the media and others to the crimes being undertaken against women in China, forced abortions. He said, This is a horrific, awful thing to do. Take a woman who's going to have a child and abort that child, uh, coercively strapping her down. He uh, got a lot of attention in China. He then defended the rights of other people to their land, not to be confiscated. And he was illegally detained, beaten, rolled up on a carpet and beaten. And the man is blind, so if you could imagine who could do such a thing. And he made a point when he left, when he escaped. I was not arrested. I was illegally detained under no law. What we want is the rule of law and accountability of officials and government agents under the law. What he is struggling for is the rule of law in China, which is the way your freedom can be realized. James Harrington, another great English figure in this tradition, Define government as an art whereby a civil society is instituted and preserved upon the foundation of common rights, which means equal rights for everyone, for interest, or to follow Aristotle and Livy, the Roman historian, and here's the famous phrase, it is the empire of laws and not of men. We want is to be ruled by equal laws applicable to everyone and not by arbitrary power. Let's turn then to security, which is intimately connected with justice and freedom. Locke says in that same passage in the Second Treatise, liberty is to be free from restraint and violence, 
from others which cannot be where there is no law. Liberty is about securing ourselves from violence from other persons or from the state, which in many cases can be the most aggressive, dangerous, and violent element that we face. Security is a key foundation of a free society. It can be produced by government. It can also be produced by private effort, by voluntary association, by private security firms, and so on. It doesn't have to be a monopoly of the state. But without security, you don't have liberty. I was in Brazil uh, early last year and was really startled to find out many Brazilian states have murder rates higher than the death rates in Iraq and Afghanistan during the war. You can just imagine. And the concern of the Brazilian liberals, they said, we want people to know this. We want people to understand our state is failing. They run a petrochemical company. They run gas stations. They do all kinds of things that could be done in the voluntary private sector, but they don't secure your right to walk down the street without being assaulted or raped, beaten, robbed, or murdered. That is a grotesque example of the state not protecting freedom, not protecting our security because they're too busy doing all these other things that could be done but other ones, uh, the market economy. And then finally, what those things lead to, which is prosperity. This one is rather different from the others because we can change a government policy to bring about more security. We can change a government policy to respect justice not confiscating people's land or their lives. <coughs> change your government policy to bring about liberty, justice, security. But you cannot create prosperity by government policy. It's not on the choice list. But you can create the conditions within which people in society can create prosperity. That's an important point. If it were on the list, our society would be poor or rich, and you get to choose. Everyone would choose rich. But we don't normally in those cases get to choose outcomes. We can only choose processes. And then we choose the processes we believe or hope will yield the outcomes that we want. But you'll never find it on the list poverty or wealth. You can't just make that choice. You can choose processes. That's where public policy analysis comes in. To show that certain processes, free trade, respect for property, freedom of the market economy, and so on, produce prosperity and other processes produce poverty and corruption instead. But even there, we should do a little bit more philosophical analysis. Adam Smith introduced a tremendous change in the world. And very few people understand how radical his book is. Because we take it for granted. It represented a fundamental change in the way people understand the world. The title of his famous book, the most famous book, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. People pass over that word nature. And they only think about causes. But he changed the understanding of the nature of the wealth of nations. Prior to Smith, for most thinkers, the wealth of the nation was how rich the king was. The king, the court, his armies, how many castles he had, what kind of fancy clothes he wore. But Smith said, that's not the nation. First, what is the nation? It's every human being and any human being chosen at random. How do those people live? So consequently, his famous challenge to mercantilism, which was the idea that you want exports are good, imports are bad, this idea still 
persists. One of the dumbest ideas ever. Very difficult to dislodge. Exports are good, imports are bad. In fact, <clears throat> exports are the price you pay to get imports, which is what you want. And you pay for that with exports. But the mercantilist fallacy persists. The idea at the time was the difference will be made up by gold flowing into the country. If you export a million pounds worth of goods and only import 500,000 pounds, the difference will be made by 500,000 pounds in gold and silver being brought into the country. And that makes the king rich because now he can use that money to hire mercenary soldiers to conquer the Netherlands, which is no longer really a major public policy concern of most countries, conquering the Netherlands. But that was, at the time, what was driving this. But Smith said, what good is gold in the king's treasury to the poor man who cannot put bread on the table to feed his children? He's not interested in that. The question is, how much of his work goes to buy food? Has it gone up or down? Those are the measures of the wealth of nations. The nation includes everyone, not just the elite, or as we would say today, the cronies who cluster around people with power, but everybody, including the most humble person in the most humble and distant village in India, is a part of the nation. And that person is counted in Adam Smith's formulation, but was not in previous formulation. And then, having thought about the nature of the nation and of wealth, we can then ask, what causes nations to be prosperous and <coughs> poor? And there, public policy analysis takes up and can ask, what is it that makes us rich or makes us poor? And on that, we have abundant evidence already. I highly recommend you go to the freetheworld.com website, maintained by the Fraser Institute of Canada. Fraser is an outstanding public policy research organization. They generate a lot of new information to drive the policy discussion within Canada, but also globally. And for years, they have had a major research agenda to measure economic freedom. If you say economic freedom leads to more wealth, less economic freedom leads to less, we can measure the wealth. How do you measure whether there's more or less economic freedom? going to say something meaningful, you have to measure that as well. And that's what they've been doing now for several decades. And the outcomes are quite, quite persuasive, in my opinion. That we see wealthy countries or countries with high degrees of economic freedom. It's a mere correlation. However, it's not that difficult, I'm sure Mara would do it in his sleep, to figure out which is the cause of which. Do wealthy countries say, hey, let's have economic freedom? Or do poor countries adopt economic freedom and become wealthy? It's actually not that difficult to test overall. <clears throat> Our job is to do that kind of research, to drive public policy, to ask those questions in each country, each context, formulate the hypothesis, go out, find the evidence, provide the analysis that is logically coherent, consistent, and makes sense, explain it to the public, and then to be able to move in the direction of better public policies. I'll conclude with a little book which I'll try to get a copy for everyone here. Now, the program I was just at in Guatemala called the Antiguo Foro is focused on the step after what you do, which is if we have an idea, we know what is a good policy, how do we convince policymakers and key stakeholders to adopt it? Because there's a reason it hasn't been adopted yet. Usually someone is benefiting from it. How do we overcome that? And the example is an outstanding one of telecommunications in Guatemala. Small country, but they have done one of the best jobs in the world. It's the lowest price telecommunication, I believe, in all of Latin America, because they did it right. And this little study goes through all the steps of how they formulated the policy <coughs> people who wrote up the laws, the research that was behind it, and how it had an impact. I can contrast that with Mexico to the north. 
Mexico is a very important, large country. Most people don't understand how big Mexico is, what a significant country it is in the world economy. And they have some of the highest telephone rates in the world. Why? Because when they privatized the state monopoly, they privatized the monopoly. This is a disaster. The state monopoly was terrible. And the private monopoly is better, but not as good as it could be. And now, who is the richest human being in the planet? Does anyone know? Carlos. Carlos Slim, the owner of the monopoly in Mexico. Wow, what a surprise that is. And now that he's the richest man in the world, he devotes his resources to making sure they never allow competition and telecommunications. In Guatemala, they did it right. They took the incredibly inefficient Guatel, the state monopoly phone company, and instead of privatizing the monopoly, they said, let's do this right, carefully, consistently with Guatemalan law, the Constitution, the sound economics, and they created competition in the market and then privatized the state assets into a competitive market. The consequence was in the first year, more Guatemalans got telephones than in the entire history of the country prior to that. And I think that counts as a, a big success. They did it because they got the research right, the law right, the strategy right. So I'll make sure each one of you gets a copy of this. It's a short study that I think is quite useful. And with that, all I can say is we have high hopes that you will do something important. You will change the world. So I'm going to check back with all of you in a hundred years. And I expect to see results in a world that is freer, is more just, People have more security for their lives, families, property, a world that is so prosperous, it's even difficult for us to imagine it today. I know you can do it. Thank you. Assault weapon. If you read the English media, you hear this term, assault weapon. It refers to how a weapon looks. It has nothing to do with its effectiveness just the way it looks. And the idea is if we ban these, then there won't be as many killings. I think this is fundamentally irrational. Uh, if you know in an automobile, you know what racing stripes are? They paint the stripe to make it look faster. And in the 1950s, they put these big fins on cars so they look like sharks. Imagine you said we want to reduce traffic fatalities and the way we're going to do it is by making it illegal to put a fin or a racing stripe on a car. You had a big national debate on this. It's, it's in my opinion, it's ridiculous and absurd. We had a 10-year period when those so-called assault weapons were banned, and it had no impact that anyone has been able to discern on violence. Absolutely zero. Not a single study has come forth saying it had any positive impact. During the time after it was Repeal, gun ownership in the United States increased quite dramatically, and the crime rate fell. So it's a difficult case for the gun control advocates to say, if we didn't have guns, it would be a less violent society. Gun ownership went like this, and crime went like that. So what is accounting for? Maybe it would have gone down faster. There we go. Uh, that's something you might be able to test for, but no one has been able to make that argument. Uh, now, let's, until 1933, and it was legalized, and the murder rate fell for 11 consecutive years. Now, you don't have to be the smartest econometrician in the world to say, that's interesting. The, it's, the murder rate is here, it's made illegal and it does this, it's made legal and it falls. Something is happening. The prohibition policies are driving this. Of the murders committed with firearms, this is what most people won't discuss publicly, overwhelmingly, they are gang-related violence, and these are drug gangs. Now here's the other element that makes people uncomfortable. 
there's one group that is overwhelmingly disproportionately represented among the victims, and that's black Americans, especially young black men. If you look at the numbers, you will be shocked at the percentage of the murder victims who are young black men. Washington, D.C., at the peak of our murder epidemic, 414 people were killed. D.C. has a mainly African-American population, so it should not surprise people that a majority of those people would be African-American. Until you look at the numbers. Out of 414, it was 413. That is where the violence is taking place in that community. And for a lot of people, they don't want to talk about it. But this has had a horrific, uh, devastating impact on black America. If you take them out, if you disaggregate the whole statistics, take out that one group, the remaining population has murder rates roughly the same as the average in Western Europe. This is a highly concentrated, catastrophic social problem driven by the war on drugs. In my opinion is we should legalize narcotics and stop this nonsense immediately and we would see the violence fall back. Other countries that are affected by this, Mexico, and again, people in America don't want to think about it. It's on the other side of the border. But the mass killings in Mexico are staggering. They're unbelievable where they'll find 49 or 60 headless bodies just dumped someplace in a field where they think these drug gangs do this because they're fighting over turf and territory. Guatemala, just to the south of them, also horrific violence. Colombia, um, and that's why, and I hope this will change, more and more Latin American political leaders are standing up and speaking out about this. President Vicente Fox of Mexico, but only after he was out of office, said, come on guys, everybody knows the answer to this. Legalize these drugs, which they had done in Mexico for personal use. But not, it's a trafficking question, drug sending it north is just a big issue. And just last week, the president of Guatemala in Switzerland came out and said, please, please, please stop this. It's killing my people. Former presidents of Brazil, of Colombia, and other countries. And I hope eventually, the President of the United States, uh, who is used to be a drug user, used to be a drug dealer, and would be in prison today if he had been caught under the laws he is enforcing now, just to make it clear. I hope he will listen to that. I think that that's what's driving the violence. The whole and, uh, but that's my take on it. There's in the state, trust me. And, and poisons alcohol. Yeah, and you'll get people dying of poisoned alcohol, all kinds of problems. Uh, <clears throat> experience that we had huge numbers of prohibition under al alcohol prohibition. Huge numbers of people died of bad alcohol. Once they legalized it, that stopped. Why? Because you could go into the store and it says what it is. And the store has liability, and the manufacturer has liability in the legal system. But if you go to the backyard dealer and you, and you get bad alcohol, what are you going to do? Sue him in court? You can't. You can't go to the police and say, arrest him because I bought illegal alcohol. They're going to arrest you first. So it's, uh, I think that even if you have an alcohol problem in the state, prohibition will only make it worse. There are other approaches to improve the situation. And similarly with narcotics. I don't deny that People have narcotics addictions that can be incredibly destructive of their lives. But the experience is you only make it worse through prohibition. There should be other approaches um, to those issues. Um, the second question about the firearms. Uh, America has always been a gun owning society uh, from the beginning of the more precise. From the beginning of the British colonization, it has been a very strong gun owning society. It's not true of all the colonists, and it doesn't always mean the pre colonial peoples as well. So I want to be a little bit more accurate and precise. 
And that's partly because of the sense that uh, you need firearms to protect yourself, your family, but also against the state. And there's a long tradition of uh, an understanding that if the dictatorship arises, it's the responsibility of the citizens to kill the dictator. And I think that's helpful, personally. Um, the other issue is for personal defense. I've used the firearm to defend myself. I'm alive. Uh, I do carry a firearm when I can. I certainly have firearms in my home. And in a culture in which people are accustomed to that, they're less dangerous than in a society where they're not. I was raised with firearms. Uh, I understand they're not toys. One of the first things that your parents teach you is this may look fun as a child to do this, bang, bang. But this device is not a toy. It's an extremely dangerous tool. And you never, ever, ever do something like that to another person. It's not, not funny, not amusing, and so on. And a responsible society uh, is possible. And the vast majority of gun owners in the United States are very responsible people. I trust them a lot more than I do the police. You just saw that recently. Everyone thinks, oh, the police should have firearms. In New York City, it was reported there was a shootout between a criminal and the police. Nine people were shot. It turned out all of them were shot by the police. All of them subsequent investigation. The police are extremely dangerous people because they have guns and they like to shoot them and they're not concerned about personal liability. In contrast, people with concealed carry weapons tend to be extremely responsible people. There was a case recently uh, of a young man with his firearm, was there with his girlfriend at a mall, a crazy person came in, shot someone, he drew his firearm and he didn't shoot. He did something police officers ought to do, but often don't. He said there was someone behind him. And you don't do that. You understand my point. So you might miss if you hit this other person. So he, he didn't shoot. Most police officers wouldn't have done that. But I would rather have lots of weapons in the hands of private citizens than in the hands of the police who kill substantial numbers of people Every year. So that's my take on this issue. Different countries may have different.